Have you ever wondered how it is that humans, you and me, are so fond of so many different animals? Yes, OK, dogs, cats, parrots, horses, goldfish, hamsters, guinea pigs, on it goes. Most of us can't do without them, mainly because our species has evolved with them over tens of thousands of years. And they're not only part of our culture, they also tell us about our very surroundings, whether or not the landscape is healthy or under threat. If in England those famous hedgerow birds are disappearing, we should worry. If, as was announced this week, the northern wet tropics of Australia are becoming devoid of many animals, dying from the heat, we should worry. And that's the message from Dr Jenny Gray at Melbourne Zoo, where she leads research on conservation for the zoos around Victoria. Here she's speaking at the Royal Society in Melbourne. Around the world, for thousands of years, people paid attention to animals. Dogs warned us of strangers and predators. Fish showed that water was safe to drink. And birds indicated air quality. In fact, we trusted birds so much that we took canaries down the coal mines. And as long as the canaries kept singing and bouncing around, we knew the air was safe. And when they stopped, you went straight to the exit. You didn't challenge the science. You didn't deny there was a problem. You headed for the exit. Today, we still rely on animals to tell us if things are safe. Millions of animals are used in laboratories to show us if substances are safe. Rats and rabbits consume medication, cosmetics, cleaning products to ascertain that if we or our children ate them, we would be all right. And yet, today, when we look to the environment, we seem to be blind to the clear indications from animals that our actions are creating a great danger. We may glimpse the problem occasionally when thousands of fish die in a river. But even then, we quickly hand off the problem to a scientific panel. And while outrage sparks a brief flare across the internet, the land clearing, the overuse of rivers, and pollution just continues. The environmental damage is visible if you just stop and look for animals. And I mean really look. Go try find them. If you want to find orangutans, you're going to have to venture into the jungles of Indonesia and Malaysia. And when you try, you're going to see what I'm talking about. As you fly in, the first thing you're going to see from the plane window is the enormity of palm oil plantations. They stretch as far as the eye can see, unrelenting, uniform, and barren, devoid of the life, color, and diversity that used to cover this tropical region. At a ground level, the impact is even worse. The palm nut barges chug along rivers, spewing out black smoke. Lorries filled with red fruit push through the villages, hooting and pushing cars out the way. And processing plants discharge toxic oil straight into rivers. To get to a pocket of jungle, you're going to travel for hours along roads flanked on either side by palm oil plantations. No trees, no birds, no monkeys just palms, all to get to a pocket of wild that we've left behind. And we do the strange thing. We think that it's okay to change a landscape if we leave a pocket behind. And we hope that in these little tiny pockets, animals will survive. But really, the pockets are just too small. The complexity of landscapes is what's critical for long-term survival. Landscapes have fire refuges. Landscapes have wet gullies and old trees. Landscapes allow for migration when it's too hot or too dry or too wet. They allow unrelated families to move to meet each other and to maintain genetic diversity. Landscapes allow for adaptation and expansion. In a small pocket of jungle in Malaysia, I ventured into a low land swamp with a group of researchers studying orangutans. They showed me a mother and her daughter up high in the trees. And while I was stuck on the ground contending with mosquitoes and leeches, the orangutans rested in a beautiful nest. And after their morning nap, the pair engaged in a battle that is familiar to every mother and daughter in the room, the battle over what to do next, where to go, 
The mother was insistent that it was time to get up and move, and then daughter was insistent it wasn't. But despite her best protestations, they finally got moving. After a robust and vocal disagreement, they headed off mostly in the same direction. They moved gracefully through these huge trees, disturbing birds and squirrels. We followed for a while, but eventually the forest was just too thick and we had to stop. My lasting memory is of the ongoing squabble, gently fading into the background sounds of a pristine jungle and being left with a really sad thought. What will happen to this pair? Will the daughter have the space to live and mate and raise her own daughter? Already the forest shows signs of illegal logging and pressure on all sides from palm oil plantations. In time of drought, will this pair, in desperation perhaps, wander out of this pocket of forest and find themselves in a palm oil plantation, treated as a pest to be hunted and killed? For what? For our desire for cheap oil and our inability to simply differentiate between palm oil that destroys forest and palm oil that's sustainably produced. If products we buy are clearly labeled with environmental indicators, we can make intelligent choices. Fridges come with sustainability ratings. Why not our food or cosmetics? It must be time to clearly label what is inside the products that we buy so that we can enjoy Easter chocolate and hot cross buns without causing harm to orangutans. I have the privilege to work with orangutans at Melbourne Zoo, and I get to know them as individuals, not as a species. I get to know them as individuals who are smart, quirky, playful, and sometimes soulful. I know that Gabby loves a handbag, and there's nothing she likes more than when someone sits down and opens it up and the wonders that come out of that. Dewey loves attention and a camera, and especially she can tell the difference between your camera and a TV camera. And Malu, our teenage boy, is a natural engineer. He understands more about torque, leverage, and forces than most people I've come across, and how to apply minimum effort for maximum damage. <laughs> if I asked you all to list your favorite animals, most of you will put tigers on that list. In fact, the research shows that 46% of you in the room will put tigers on that list. Most global lists put tigers at or near the top. When I ask you about orangutans, 35% will have put orangutans on your list. Few of you will have put our state emblems, the helmeted honey eater, or the utterly adorable leadbeater's possum. Even fewer will name our endangered frogs or butterflies. If we can't change a single piece of legislation to save our favorite species, orangutans and tigers and the jungles they live in, what hope do our own species have? They're no less beautiful or impressive or worthy of our love and attention. They need our help as much as the charismatic and colorful, and they also need us to stop and pay attention, to look and listen, and then to act. Our home here in Victoria is threatened. From our water catchments to our valleys, we pollute and destroy habitat. And then we wonder, where did all the insects go? When we've changed the DNA of plants to make them inedible and sprayed insecticide everywhere. We need to change. We need to listen to the animals or we'll be left listening to the silence that remains when they're all gone. Interestingly, small birds are once again leading the way to show the danger of coal mines. In Queensland, a small black-throated finch lives where Adani plans to create one of the largest coal mines in the world. Scientists have identified that the actions to create the mine threaten this already endangered bird. Instead of running for the exit, we hear debates about the value of this little bird and see attacks on the motivation of scientists. If our predecessors had treated canaries with the same disdain, they would simply have died. Without jungles and forests, deserts and grasslands, our planet is so much more dangerous. These systems provide balance and resilience. Around the globe, animals are trying to get our attention to tell us we have to change. 
Last year, the World Wildlife Fund's Living Planet report recorded the catastrophic loss of wild animals, with a 60% reduction in abundance since 1970. We cannot afford to lose one more hectare of jungle or grassland or wild space. So what can you do? Well, actually, a whole lot. Each and every one of us is more powerful than we can even start to believe. We are consumers, we are voters, we are investors. We take decisions every day that make an impact. And you can join us in taking action. Don't wait. You can make your home more sustainable. You can make your business more sustainable. You can avoid products that destroy native forests. And you can blow bubbles instead of releasing balloons outdoors. And in the coming election, you can ask politicians if they back palm oil labeling. So you can buy products that contain certified sustainable palm oil. Simple tasks like labeling palm oil on all products would empower us to listen, to hear the chainsaws clearing forests, and to see the direct impact of our addiction to cheap oil, and allow us to act to avoid the products that tip our environment over the edge, and to ensure a future in which we share this beautiful planet with our goofy, hairy, opinionated, and outrageously smart cousins, the orangutan. Thank you. Yes, there's plenty we can do, especially in the next two to three weeks. Dr. Jenny Gray is actually an engineer and ethicist and heads a conservation organisation spanning the zoos in Victoria at Melbourne, Werribee and Hillsville. Zoos have changed. They're fun to visit, but science centres as well, saving the animals. I'm Robin Williams.